Well, hello everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to Fridays with Sandy. That would be Sandy Kreisberg, the founder of hbsguru.com. We have with us today a really intriguing candidate who has applied only to MIT Sloan. He is lay. He uh, came from Beijing to do his undergraduate studies in the U.S. He has uh, a 3.79 on his undergraduate degree, and he has a master's from Columbia University in mechanical engineering. Uh, after a summer internship with GE Healthcare, he worked at Caterpillar for two years as the first digital engineer, and he has been working for a little over a year at Nestle uh, as the youngest digital manufacturing expert right now. And his GRE, it's a 168 quant and a 154 verbal. What do you think, Sandy? I think you're a very powerful candidate, and my understanding is you want a mock interview. Yes, that's correct. Okay. The, the way you, people like you get mock interviewed, I've, I've noticed lately, is the interviewers often do a deep dive on your industry, either your current job or if you've worked in a consistent industry. In your case, uh, well, I'm just going to do it, all right? Uh, and you, you, our viewers can say, oh, yeah, that's how a mock interview is going to go with a guy like this. OK, so very often the first question they'll ask is, tell me what you're doing now. Yeah. So so currently I'm working for Nestle as a digital manufacturing expert. So what that means is um, as Nestle, a large corporation uh, looks at different technologies and um to enhance their factories, uh, you know, to stay uh, competitive. Yes. Stop right. Stop right there. How's he doing, John? Uh, he's, uh, you know, not yeah, getting... John's John's the John's the good cop. So. Not getting right to the point. <laughs> you won't pass your interviews if if that's the way you kept up. You you will flunk your interview. They'll say uh, the guy's English is okay, but uh, what he's incapable of doing, and possibly in any language. It's just giving clear, concise, short answers to the question. The question, what you're doing now, is something everyone in the world should be prepared for as an interview. Were you interviewed at MIT? No, an interview is scheduled, uh, I think, two weeks from now. Uh, maybe a week, a week from now, yeah. Okay. Uh, you, uh, MIT has a, isn't MIT the hot tub, uh, John? A hot tub? Yeah, don't they interview? Aren't you? Isn't that part of a group interview, or am I confusing it with? Oh no, that's Warden. Yeah, that's Warden. Yeah, uh, yeah, Warden would saves saves time and money. Yeah, I, okay. I, I would. Let's, I mean, let's get back I know to this for our interview, but I will say that applying to only one school and that school being MIT is a risky strategy to begin with. Yeah, it is. They they uh, they've got a small class. So the um, acceptance rate is is really daunting. Uh, uh, I agree with John there. Okay, so to tell me, let's try this again. To, to, hey, could you tell me what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, currently I'm working for Nestle as a digital manufacturing expert. So what I'm doing now is uh, to help Nestle look at different, to learn, test, and evaluate different technologies and bring the most critical ones to the manufacturing shop floors. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. I still don't get it. You, what you say is I'm working for Nestle. I've got a job called a, a digital manufacturing. What we explore is new developments in digital manufacturing that Nestle could use. It's an exciting field. And then you got it? Yeah, should I uh, maybe keep on going like why I'm doing it and why the business can no. benefit from it? Okay. Best interview advice, shut up. <laughs> Just answer the question as quickly and directly as you can. Answer as quickly Stay as silent. you can and stop talking. The biggest mistake people make is talking too much. I've said this before, I'll say it again. There are still people at Harvard Business School who are answering the question, what are you doing now? And the interview started two years ago, okay? <laughs> What's it? Could you take? What do you want your classmates to know about uh, digital manufacturing? Yeah, so digital manufacturing or digital transformation in general. 
it, it, it changes the way that business operates. Uh, I think during the past three years, everybody can see that uh, companies with um, great digital uh, solutions or with enabled with digital transformation can stay competitive. Uh, and companies yeah, without- you're, hey, you really got to get this down. You're, you're, you're incapable of answering these questions at present. You really need to figure out what you need to say and how to say it. Uh, and, and they'll be interested in it. Yeah, John is agreeing with me, but he's too nice to be. <laughs> to, to be. Uh, I, I think it's like the use of technology has transformed manufacturing, and I'm at the center of that. Well, you need a definition of digital manufacturing. Yes. Digital manufacturing is the interception, the intersection of manufacturing with uh, di digital capabilities. And a good example of that is Bang. How about that as an answer? Yeah, that's a good answer. And, you know, what, one of the things that you've done, Lee, that I think is really cool is you redesigned pizza production processes for uh, Nestle globally. Uh, everyone can relate to that, right? We, you know, yeah, so it's that, that good. good point. Many so, it's that, so, yeah, so let's hear your answer, Lee. <laughs> yeah, so, so digital manufacturing is a... Um, area where it involves both manufacturing and technology. Um, and a good example of that is um, I launched a smart warehouse solution at um, one of our factories to redesign the whole uh, pizza manufacturing processes that changed the way uh, that operators work on a daily basis. So uh, that's, that's a good example. Give me, give me a simple example of that. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. One of the things we did was we installed, we, we have a pizza manufacturing place and a lot of operators, you know, have a lot of functions. And what we did was figured out a way to make the functions shorter and in a better order. And it increased production 14%. I'm making that up, but that sounds like a good answer. Well, in fact, what he did reduced quality defects by 50% and increased product uh, throughputs by 10%. So there are numbers here. Yeah, but the numbers aren't going to save you from a bad interview. This is critical. Okay, sure. the interview is, is is searching. They've already they've already seen you. They want you. They know you. I said it before. I'll say it again. I'll ask John to say what I'm about to say, but I'll save that problem. The interview flunks people. Okay, yes, they're not looking for superstars. The interview is for people who cannot speak English and who, who cannot formulate their ideas in a clear way. That's, that's what you don't show off. Don't try and impress them. Just try and answer the questions in a clear, short way. Tell me why you went to Oakland University. Yeah, so um, I, I knew, well, and I graduated from high school. I knew a couple of friends going to, um, well, actually, um, at my undergrad back in China, I knew a couple of friends going to Oakland University. And I talked to them, Oakland has great program there, um, research opportunities or co-op opportunities with um, auto, some auto companies like Ford and GM. Uh, so that's why, um, yeah, I went there and wanted to get more hands-on experience and the, um, also the U.S. education experience. Good. That was a good answer. Okay. Yeah, that was a very good answer. Basically, well, I was in China. I had friends who went there. They, they, they had similar interests to mine. They told me that o Oakland uh, was a very good mechanical engineering school and I could do blah and blah. And that's why I went there. What was. And, and I think your point about the co op experiences with uh, major US automakers is, is really crucial as well. It's helpful. But uh, if you left that out, it still would have been a good answer. That's my point. You're not being graded on how much information you can pack in there. You're just being graded on whether you can give a short, clear answer. Um, I, I wanna underline that. What John said is true, but more importantly is, even if you hadn't said that, it was a good answer. Yeah, so and I'm, point, I'm adding that only because obviously Oakland University is not a well-known or highly ranked institution. Uh, Columbia certainly yeah. is. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, let's get back to this guy. reason to go to Oakland. Yeah. So what, what was, this is another classic question. What was unexpected when, when you got there? 
Yeah, so um, I guess first of all, the weather I have to say, um, late late September, early October, I saw snowing, and something I've never I've never expected before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and also in terms of the university itself, um, actually, I saw I, I knew a lot of students um, who just came out of state uh, studying at OU, and that was unexpected as well. I thought it would be just you know, with the local students studying there, but um, it, it wasn't. Yeah. What, what, what was unexpected about the, the way college operates in China versus U.S.? Yeah, um, college in China is more, I guess, learning experience is more on paper. Like you read books, you learn it, and um, um, you reflect it. And um, in the U.S., it's more hands-on. You have labs. Uh, you have different hands-on opportunities to um, to sharpen your skills. So that's the difference. Good. Okay. You're, you're getting better, man. You, you, you get the improvement award for uh, <laughs> increasing your, you're, you're doing good. You're, if, if so, those answers are perfect. You, you answer questions like that. You will pass the interview. Uh, what was your favorite class? Yeah. My favorite class was the, um, uh, there was a heat transfer class, um, involved a lot of hands-on uh, projects and experience. So we actually had an uh, opportunity to take apart a, um, a heat exchanger and to see um, how it works physically. And so that was my first hands-on experience um, in the US. Um, and also uh, that got me interested in the uh, heat transfer field. And later I did uh, further some, you know, some more research on that field. And actually I published a paper on, 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 that, um, on that topic and did a presentation at uh, downtown Detroit to multiple auto companies. So yeah, that was my favorite class at OU. Okay, uh, this is a small point, but you, you should you just should have named the class and said what was exciting about it. We didn't need a, 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 another two minutes of bragging after that. Uh, in, in the actual answer you gave, it was okay, but I wanna train you to just answer the question and shut up because you, you have a habit of talking too much. You did a good job on the last question, but if, if you answered, you, you've done a, you've gotten lost on other questions. So just try and keep it shorter and just answer the question. Um, and where, where, where's the, like the cutoff point <laughs> for, the, for my last question? Sooner rather than better. Okay. Uh, oh, the cutoff point was I said, what was your favorite class? And the answer is my favorite class was a heat exchange class. We, we, it was done in a laboratory setting. It was hands-on. The instructor was terrific. And, my, and I actually met a couple of friends who remain friends with me now. The end. Got it. The danger is to talk too much and get lost. That's the way you, you screw an interview. People have a hard time internalizing the fact that the only thing that could happen at an interview is bad. An interview is pass fail. They're already sold on you. All, all you can do in the interview is make it worse. Uh, Got it. Um, it. It's hard to internalize that, but the, the takeaway is don't try, don't show off, don't lecture, because that's when you start going bad. There, there's a habit now of asking industry questions. Who would you say, uh, well, first tell me about Nestle. What is Nestle? Yeah. For people, people, most people in America know Nestle for one or two famous products, but tell me more, what, what, what else does the company do? Yeah, we make um, a great variety of, of food and beverage products. Uh, so maybe as you know, like Starbucks, many, many people take that for granted. Well, maybe just known as Starbucks, Starbucks itself, but um, it's actually part of the Nestle products. Yeah. And also we make um, some other like frozen uh, plant-based meat, uh, frozen meals, noodles, uh, or pizza, candies, like anything, like you name it. And possibly we can find it in our products. Okay. That, that's uh, okay. Who, who are... Uh... Who are Nestle's competitors, if it's possible to identify it, or what would the market be? Yeah, in terms of food, uh, food uh, companies, um, maybe like Tyson, 
uh, Tyson make meat and other other uh, food products. Um, in terms of beverage, uh, PepsiCo definitely uh, one of the competitors. Good. Uh, so you should be prepared to answer this question, even if it doesn't come up in this form. Uh, you know this thing called uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. You know that SWOT, as it's called. That's the way yep. people analyze companies. Uh, tell me what you think Nestle's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are, and do it fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. Uh, yeah, so, so in terms of strength, um, definitely the biggest strength uh, for Nestle, I would say it's it's brand um, brand name. It's the reputation. In terms of the um, the opportunities or the weaknesses, um, it's kind of second area weaknesses. So it's I would say it's too large for or too big for its own good. And it's so large and needs to be. Well, let's okay. Yeah, explain that to me. Are you just saying that, or is that true? What what does that mean? What yeah, would you recommend for food and beverage uh, industry? There, the the industry is highly fragmented, so a lot of mergers and acquisitions going on, and it's hard to have one centralized strategy. Or, uh, you know, like uh, it's hard to 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 manage. You know, you, different... you, you don't know what you're saying. You said that a weakness is that it's too big, and then I said, "Explain that to me." And you said, "Well, it's a fragmented." industry and there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So the way it looks like it's going to be is in 10 years, where there are now 50 companies in this industry, they're going to be 15. And that's just the way it that's just the way the industry organizes itself. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm, I'm not making it up. I'm, I'm giving you what I think would happen, accepting what you told me is true. John, you want? Am I? Am I? Feel free to correct me here. Well, I actually think the bigness at Nestle is a big advantage because you're dealing with a lot of major retailers who have a lot of clout in the marketplace. So being big uh, helps you to negotiate with those big retailers that you have to sell to. The other thing about being big is your distribution power is immense, and that yeah, is a okay. big advantage to Nestle. If if Nestle has disadvantage by being big, it's it's that it's easily disrupted by smaller, newer, uh, more flexible and innovative incumbent, uh, startups that are gonna disrupt it, it as an incumbent player. And you might, and I'm sure there are plenty of examples of that as there would be against Procter and Gamble and General Mills and other- Yeah, okay, big, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and, Lee, here's your homework, all right? You should really steep yourself in the industry. You should, you should look up Nestle on Wikipedia. You'd be amazed what it has to say. Okay, it's always a great place to start. You, you, you know, you, 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 you've never studied the industry in a kind of student business school kind of way. You've got a no, lot of hands he's, on. He's an engineer, right? That's the other thing. I mean, you're asking him a high level strategic question and he's merely an engineer. So yeah. that's interesting, right? That's true, but be, it's a very common question. They just expect you to know it, particularly since you know, you want to go to business school, apparently. So that's real homework, okay, for everybody. Know your industry. Know your company's strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities. And then, and, and then know what industry you're in and who the other key players are. Sometimes they say, you know, if you were a consultant, you know, and you, and, and you had studied Nestle's and now we're giving a... Uh, 10 minute report to the CEO of Nestle. What what would you say? I was saying if I were a consultant or based on my current role, what would I say to the no, CEO? No, you were hired as a consultant. You were a you were a big four consultant. And Nestle said, I want you guys to come in here and sniff around for whatever you do, six months, and tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and how we can do better. This, this actually happens, doesn't it, John? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to be frank, I never thought about that question uh, before. So probably I'll always mention some of the um, um, the takeaways on the um, the SWOT analysis on the opportunity and yeah. And okay. Side. Blah blah blah. Just just start thinking that way. Okay. Okay. This is more homework on the company, the industry. You know, 
what's the stock doing? Is, is Nestle the, the ticker or is it some other company owns Nestle or what? The Nestle is publicly it. traded, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it publicly traded? Uh, yes, I believe so. And actually, Nestle, I think it owns a lot of shares and, and um, of other companies. So it's kind of like right. the other. That's part of it. But just, just tell me, do you know what, what exchange is traded on the New York or the NASDAQ? Uh, that's going to be my homework, too, I guess. <laughs> uh, that's something you should really know. Okay. Here's another question we're going to ask a guy who's, wor who's worked for Caterpillar and Nestle. What's the difference in the culture? Okay, let's ask two questions. Tell me about Caterpillar. What is it? And what, what did you do there? Yeah, Caterpillar is a uh, one of the best heavy equipment manufacturers in the world. Uh, we make drivetrains, uh, hydraulic cylinders, stuff like that. And what I did there was um, as the first digital engineer in North America region, um, a similar role as um, I'm doing here at Nestle. Um, driving digital transformations um, to help uh, build or convert a lighthouse or pioneer factory. Well, I, I would stop Where's here. the culture? Okay, let, let me, I'm going to dig down on that, but be, expect this question. Was the culture different at Caterpillar and Nestle or was it mostly the same? Yeah, the culture is different. So at Nestle, it's more a flat culture or at least for, for my group, it's, it's pretty flat. Uh, and the Caterpillar, I was working at the factory, so it's more hierarchical. So we have kind of like 10 different layers of um, leadership groups. Um, yeah. Good. Okay. I see you've, you're a student of our former tapes here with the, the way to describe a culture simply is whether the culture is flat or hierarchical. You know, uh, and it's like, how, how hard is it for you to talk to your supervisor's supervisor? Okay. At certain companies, that would never happen. <laughs> no matter what happened, it would never happen. At certain companies, you, you, the, 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 your supervisor supervisor would have an open door policy, or you you can meet him at lunch. Okay, so those are those are just quick uh, test probes of what what their culture is like. And everybody who's going to be interviewed by business schools should have that have answers to those questions. They should know what the culture is at every company they've worked in, how they're different, and which one they prefer. Which culture do you prefer? Yeah, I prefer flat culture. Um, so I have more access to different leadership. And that's part of my, my role, my responsibility uh, to consult, uh, kind of like internal consultant, uh, consult factory managers or even um, vice president for, for their for the future digital transformation roadmaps. Do you have, I'm looking at your Nestle, I'm looking at your resume here and it says Nestle Expert Digital Manufacturing. Do you have a title? Yeah, that, that's my title. Expert Digital Manufacturing? Wow. Uh, yeah. That's not so a title. Have, well, maybe for a Swiss company it is. <laughs> is expert part of the title? Yeah, that is. That is part of the title. Actually, um, are there, are so there I'm, other titles like knows a lot or? <laughs> <laughs> or starter. <laughs> I think that's why um kind of like maybe the, the culture is is more flat and lastly at least for for my group uh, we have like expert digital manufacturing expert like digital manufacturing managers and directors and then vice president so it's it's pretty pretty simple and don't, don't have and also I also have engineers um and uh, all so of those that's, you, you, like uh, a more common title to uh, people in the U.S. would be analyst, or is that uh, demoting you? Uh, I wouldn't That's, say I'm, <laughs> I'm an analyst. I think he's um, more hands-on, right? You're more hands-on than an analyst would be. Yeah, um, I think the role is like 50% um, product management, um, maybe. Well, I would say 30% product management, 30% um, kind of like consultancy, 30% okay. engineering. Um, Okay, you go. The, the the title, the official title is expert digital manufacturing. Yeah, it may be part of the translation, but let me tell you what I do, and then give the speech you just gave. Yeah, that was good. I like I like the division of, of labor there. Got it. Good. What about uh, the human question, Sandy? Why do you want an MBA, and what what do you hope to achieve with it? Yeah, what was oh, rolling well, onto that? Give, give, here's before we get to that. 
outline your career after your MBA. What job do you want after you graduate from business school? What job do you want as your next job after that? And what would be the, you know, your dream job at the height of your career? Yeah, so immediately after my MBA, I like to be a general manager at a large consumer good company like Nestle or PepsiCo. And um, yeah, and, and walking my way to my long-term goal as the, um, I want to be an impact, impactful or impactful leader who can make a difference in the- uh, Yeah, blah, blah, group. blah. Give me the titles. Yeah, the CEO or COO of a large consumer good company. That's your second stop. What do you want to be after that? The president? <laughs> I think the CEO, I thought the CEO. The question was, was what, what job do you want after business school? And then usually there's a second job after that where you switch companies maybe. And then the, the question was then, what, where, what job would you want, you know, at the height of your career? So it's three different phases that you should be able to talk about as a roadmap for your career. Do, do yeah, you got, got it, got it. So so for me, um, I don't expect myself to to switch industries. I'm like I'm not gonna be strategy consultant and you know MBB and then switch to the uh, kind of like uh, large corporation. So I'll be staying within the large corporation and um, hopefully promoting um, to my to my dream job as the CEO or CEO of the company. Well, a lot of people who do that go to if 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 you if you looked at the CEOs of a lot of companies you admire. I'm not betting, but I've got a good feeling a lot of those people went to business school, then they spent two years or three years at McKinsey, and then they went back into industry. It's very common for business school graduates to join like Bain or BCG or McKinsey, just to get the experience, general strategy. It's a good way to learn a lot fast. I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's something you might think about. You should yeah, have got it. Here, a, a good, good homework for you would be to find three or four role models, people who's, you know, you admire, people who, your role models at the end, at the end, they're at the end of careers that you go, boy, that guy's a role model. I'd like a career like that guy. I'd like a career like that guy. Identify three or four people like them and just see how they did it. It's just a useful uh, piece of homework and it's interesting. And it, it provides you with cannon fodder for a lot of questions. Yeah, it's I see. Uh, actually, the CEO of um, Nestle, Mark Schneider, it, uh, he he's a he got his MBA from from HBS, and he went to I think a private equity firm for a couple of years, and then switched to the general general management. Exactly, and my guess is he was a consultant before he went to HBS, so he he just went from business school to private equity. That's that's a little hard to do, but. Obviously, he was a very talented person, as history has shown. John, do you have any general questions uh, for uh, Lee here? Well, I think uh, I'd like to know um, your your immediate goal, as not to a position, but your immediate goal in getting the MBA, I think, should be expressed, which is you want to move out of this na more narrow engineering role into a management position where you have oversight over you know, the, the more of what business really is, right? Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, my division is, I guess it's more, um, it's more like just one business unit, I would say. And I wanna have like a holistic view of the whole whole company, uh, like everything and just general management. Uh, yeah, sure. The uh, Lee, let me ask you this. How, how many people, how many of your peers at Nestle or or Caterpillar have gone to business school after yeah. you knew them? Yeah, I talked to three folks. I think one went to, one took a rotational program um, and then went to HBS and two went to GSB. Uh, I only talked to those three folks, but not many, definitely. Uh, but there are some. Not many. 
That's is correct. The answer. Osage uh, burn, is that good news or bad news? I think in his case, it's good news because I think that generally there aren't that many applicants from companies like Nestle in the elite MBA pool. Totally agree with you. Business schools, real business schools love companies like Nestle's. They actually totally. make stuff. Yeah. They make stuff you can eat. Okay. They're real companies. <laughs> it's a real company with customers and uh, stuff on your shelf. Business schools love companies like Nestle, and that's, what, that's who they think they're serving. So, so what is Nestle's frozen pizza brand? Yeah, pizza we got. Uh, we got CPK, California, um, Pizza Kitchen, I believe, um, and a bunch of, I can't even name all of them, but uh, we got a bunch of frozen meals and pizza, hot pockets. Uh, yeah, literally, you'll name it. Like, I think we have, we have like 2,000 brands in total. So, I mean, Nestle is the world's largest publicly held food company. You're doing yeah. a little fast homework on the side here, John? You're yeah, right. and uh, it has a very big uh, market cap, and it's doing quite well in the stock market over the last five years. Yeah, you should know all that, Lee. Wikipedia, I'm not kidding. <laughs> we'll do. Hey, one last thing I want to leave you with. Uh, look, the fact that MIT is going to interview you is a really good sign. Uh, but for all people out there, Sandy and I would agree that uh, it is incredibly risky to apply to only one business school because, you know, at this level, admissions is so highly selective that very, very good people like you get rejected every single day. So that's why you want the strategy of applying to a set of schools. And based on our conversation with you, Sandy, do you think he has a shot at Harvard? Uh, are we missing um, uh, a standardized test score? Did I miss that? No, we, we have it. It's a GRE. He did well on the quant side, not so well on the verbal side. I think you're, you're in the 60th percentile on verbal and the 90th percentile on math, right? Yep, that's correct. That's when I applied for, for MIT. So it was if like a get, one month. If you could get over 80% on both sides, you, you've got a real chance at Harvard. They, they, love everything, they love everything else about you. The fact that you work for these blue chip companies, these mainline product yeah, producing household name yeah. companies. That's yeah, GE Healthcare, that is a favorite company of Harvard. Caterpillar is a favorite company of Harvard, even though my guess is there are not a lot of people with, uh, if, if you, you know, froze the HBS campus and said, anybody here ever work for Caterpillar? You could get no responses. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and then the master's degree from Columbia uh, gives you- In mechanical a engineering, yeah, that, that, they go for that too. That's a big deal. You're so, a yeah. so if for any reason uh, MIT passes on you this year, I really think you need to check out Harvard Business School. You need to check out Carnegie Mellon. You might want to reapply to MIT. Uh, you got to retake the GRE, get the verbal score up. You will undoubtedly score much better this time. I mean, just by virtue of <clears throat> being here and working in English all this time is going to help you get a better score. And everyone who takes a test more than once Always gets a better. Right. Hey, hey, John, here's a nasty question. Yeah. MIT cares more or cares less about standardized test results more. than its peer business schools? More, because I think part of this is, you know, the whole quantity part of MIT. So they have great respect for a standardized test score above and beyond other schools and would likely over index it in admission decisions. Well, but you seem to have survived that one. But it, yeah, if you don't get in, to take the test over again, apply to Harvard. Absolutely. They, they'll go for you, man. Yeah. Meantime, good luck to you. Uh, good luck on your interview. You know, I, do your homework and you will do well. Find out about MIT. They really want to know why, you want, why you're applying there. All right, Lee, good luck to you. Sandy, thanks once again. Shalom. And for all of you out there. Thanks for watching.